When Mark Marin started his podcast WTF with Mark Marin out of his garage in September 2009, he was in a dark place. He was in his mid 40s, going through a divorce, his comedy career had hit a wall, and he didn't have a plan B. The podcast, which features interviews with comedians, writers, and other entertainment personalities, breathed new life into Mark Marin and into his career. It quickly became one of the most talked about and listened to podcasts on the internet. Guests have included Conan O'Brien, Janine Garofalo, Robin Williams, Chris Rock, and Louis C.K., who actually teared up during a conversation about how their friendship had fallen apart. And now comes Marin, a television show based on Mark Marin's life that debuted May 3rd on IFC. Let's take a look at the trailer from Marin. There's a homeless guy going through your garbage. That's not a homeless guy, that's my dad. When are you gonna stop acting like an asshole and talk to your father? Hi, Mom. It's your mother. Yeah, I know, Mom. What'd you lose, Mark? Your balls? You're emotionally exhausted. You are needy. You're too angry. You sound like a woman. No, I don't. <laughs> Why, do I look fat? You don't care that I pee on guys, but you're freaked out right now that I made you banana bread. I know, it's weird, right? I'd do anything for you, anything. Would you move a body for me? Hell yes, dude, wait, a dead body? Are we recording this? Is this the way it works? Hello? <laughs> yeah. Are you gonna interview me or? Marin, all new Fridays at 10. Only on IFC. So our co-sponsor tonight is Sketchfest. We're delighted to have them as a partner. Yay, Sketchfest. And Mark Marin is here tonight with his new memoir, Attempting Normal. Please join me in welcoming him to the JCCSF. Shabbat Shalom. How are you? How's everything? Thank you, Barbara, for the lovely, uh, lovely intro. We're going to leave the lights on so I can just see the faces of judgment, or what are we going to do here? Is this going to be a... <laughs> yeah, let's take those down a little bit. They don't have to be all the way down, but just so everyone's sort of a vague profile and not specifically looking at me with need and expectation. I... Uh, you know, it was interesting the way you brought me up. I want to make it clear that Louis did not cry because of our friendship. <laughs> he cried because he was reminded of his daughter being born. I don't want any information going out that isn't true. Uh, he's, he's not that sensitive. I, um, so uh, I'm here. I'm going to read. Uh, I don't have a specific presentation in mind. I figured I'd just wing it because that's uh, what I do. I hope that doesn't bother you. I think preparation is, uh, you know, is, is overrated. Um, not into preparing. I resent preparers uh, because you're cowards. You're cowards. You know, you just, you can't wing it for a couple minutes. You're afraid. Um, I, I wrote this book. How do, how do you want to start? How, what can I tell you uh, immediately what is going on right now? I hope I'm not uh, getting too happy. I don't think I'm happy, but I think my biggest fear is hubris. I think my biggest fear is some inflated ego, because I'm annoying when I'm insecure. Uh, but if I get too content, the, the, the arrogance is mind-blowing. And it's not like I really have to be concerned about that, because today, just when I was at the hotel, the car was, was late. And uh, you know, so I called the service. The publisher sent the car for me which is nice, it's not that big a deal, it wasn't a stretch or anything, but it was a car, and it was late, you know, and I needed to get here to be early so Barbara wouldn't freak out. Um, and it was like 10 minutes late, so I called the service and I go, you know, I'm waiting for this car, and they're like, I'm gonna call and check, I put on hold. They call from their center office to San Francisco and they get back on the phone and they said, you know, the guy's in traffic, he's about five minutes away, so now he's 10 minutes late, and this guy's in traffic, so that's gonna be 15 minutes late. So 20 minutes go by, he's still not there. And I got back on the phone, and I felt myself getting this weird, entitled, you know, attitude. And, like, I was already planning what I was going to say to this driver, you know. 
So I, I said, you know, I called 10 minutes ago and you said the guy was in traffic and he's not here yet. And so they, they put me on hold again. They call the guy back they, and, they, and they come back on. They said, he's still in traffic. And I said, well, he's a fucking professional driver, isn't he? <laughs> he couldn't prepare for traffic. And as I'm on the phone with them, I see this guy drive up. And that, like, it was fortunate that I said this to the dispatch because that's what I was going to say to the driver. Or, or, or so I thought. See, this is, this is my problem, and I think it's, it's pertinent to the podcast as well, is that I was really going to try to do that. I was really going to try to get into that car. And when he apologized, I was going to try to say, do you do this for a living? You know, do, are you a professional driver? I mean, how is traffic an issue I should have to deal with <laughs> if you're a professional driver? And that's what I was ready to say. And I got into that car with that attitude. The guy said, hey, I'm sorry. And I went, it's okay, dude. <laughs> I didn't talk to him after that, but I was okay with it. <laughs> I wanted him to feel a little of my judgment. Um, so I wrote this book, and I should, I should tell you uh, a little bit about what's going on with the book. My father is a pathological narcissist who's bipolar, and none of you need to tweet that. Um, I think it's pretty out there. And, uh, and he is not talking to me right now because of this book. So that's pretty exciting. <laughs> you know, I didn't know how he was going to respond to this book. But I knew that this was a possibility. <laughs> he had been sort of trying to feed, and the show too. The show, like I couldn't, I got Judd Hirsch to play him. <laughs> if that is like, <laughs> my, my father is a hugely draining, you know, fragmented uh, asshole. You know, <laughs> Judd is an endearing Jew. I got Judd, I couldn't think of a better tribute to my father than to, to, to hide the fact that there is much more contempt in me towards him than I could ever have at Judd Hirsch. <laughs> but that wasn't enough. So it was, it was funny too, because when Judd was on set, and I think I've talked about this a little bit publicly, but I, I mean, I might as well tell you stories, then we'll read some stories. Are you guys coming in or are you leaving already? You had enough? <laughs> That's it. It's nothing like I thought it would be. <laughs> Sit down. I, um... <laughs> Far be it. You left the lights a little on. I'm going to manage the room. There I, can, I can see what's happening in here. So my father has been... Uh, there's an upside to this. Now, I don't, I don't know how to say this without getting too emotional. Perhaps I'll read something about my father. I, I, I don't know. And I don't know how emotional I'm going to get. But when you, uh, when you are the offspring of a narcissist, you at some point realize that they just see you as sort of a limb. You know, like you're this part of them that is supposed to behave a certain way in, in the way that they see it, uh, that, that you should behave. They think you're just an extension of them. And he had been prodding me a little bit about the show and about the book, sort of like, so uh, what's... Uh, so what's it gonna be about? You know, like, and I, I knew what that meant. That was code for, are you gonna throw me under the bus? Am I in trouble here? And, uh, and you know, he is in trouble. So, <laughs> so the, the weird thing was is that when the book came out and the show was about to premiere, he started emailing me like every day. A uh, lawyer called me, said he saw a coming attraction for the show. I'm not gonna take any action, but I want you to know that this is on the table. <laughs> um, this was like the first email, you know, and then, you know, a paragraph later, there's like, congratulations, you know, he's nuts, you know, so, so, so this started the thing, like, you know, I don't know, oh, then I went on Howard Stern, and my father, who's, you know, a, a bipolar guy and very self-aware, but completely narcissistic, uh, so he's not that self-aware, but he knows he's bipolar. He, you know, he hears me on Stern, which he never listens to. The only upside of whatever's happening between me and my father right now is out of his own fear, he's never paid more attention to me in his life. <laughs> and like he's searching on Google, he's listening to shit. 
you know, up to a month ago, he hadn't even listened to my podcast, and he'd been on three of them. Um, <laughs> so he hears me on Stern, and he writes me, he's like, you're exhibiting classic uh, symptoms of mania. You know, I'm, we're concerned. I've got medical people calling me to ask if you're medicated. So he's got lawyers and doctors calling him, apparently, about every action I take in the public. And uh, I don't know, you know, it just got to a point where I, I couldn't, uh, you know, I, I just didn't want to engage with them because I, there was no negotiating. The shit is done. Um, there was no negotiating anyways. I didn't know what a phone call would mean. I just didn't, I didn't want the buzz kill, you know what I mean? Like I, I wrote a whole piece in here about, you know, how my father destroyed my college graduation because he decided he was gonna jump off a bridge that day. So he wasn't gonna do it. See, this is the thing about narcissists and, and by, you know, if you got a bipolar person in your family, it's sad and there's a threat of them suicide being, you know, possibly committing suicide. But if you have a bipolar narcissist in your family, they're never going to fucking kill themselves. <laughs> you know, my entire life, you know, I get these phone calls from my dad. I don't want to live anymore. You know, and, and it gets to us, you know, you go through about 10 years of that. You're like, when's it going to happen? When? Is this, can I look forward to this? Is this gonna happen? Like, that was one of the reasons I started doing comedy was, uh, you know, my mother, like I would come home and my father would be in bed, miserable, depressed. And my mother would say, and I was like in junior high, my mother, he, it really came on when I was about in junior high. My mother would say, uh, why don't you go upstairs and make your father laugh? You're the only one who can. What wow, tough crowd. Um, <laughs> but I think that's one of the reasons, I, I, I guess why I'm telling you this is that, you know, I don't, a lot of people ask me about the podcast and why, you know, wh how, what is my interview style or, or what is it that I do on there that makes it good or, or you know, or why is it effective? And the only thing I can come up with is that, you know, I grew up with a very charismatic kind of, you know, um, unpredictable, you, you know, narcissistic, egocentric, sort of self-centered dude who I had to adapt to my whole life. So my entire life has been preparing me to interview celebrities. Um, <laughs> I, can, I just create an immediate you know, bond, it's be symbiosis. Anybody, like I, I, I like talking to them. So you want me to read some of this? I think that's what we do with these things, correct? That's what you expect, is the type of audience it is. <laughs> Where you're, you're sitting there nicely, and you're like, this will be interesting. He's going to read from his, his text. <laughs> I've been reading this because I like to read this. It's about, it's, uh, you know, the, some of the stuff some of you have heard me talk about, but, uh, you, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a stand-up comedian, and that's all I ever wanted to be. Um, and, you know, now I do this other thing, you know, I do my podcast and people have really come around for that and, you know, I'm very proud of it and, you know, I, I like being an interviewer and I'm glad that people think I'm good at it. But, you know, I, I, I only, only wanted to be a comedian. And this is sort of um, about how I started. And I, I never know when I read too much. I never know what, what parts are the parts to read, but I think I'll give you the whole, it's, you know, it's not that long. None of these are that long. Why are, you know, this is getting a little meta. I'm now giving you the, the insecure voiceover with the actual action. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't read that, Mark. Well, why are you talking to me out loud? We're in front of people. Was that a sneeze? Should we say bless you? Or? This is called 26. Years ago, I did a particularly angry set on stage. I talked about AIDS, the end of the world, and how silly and hopeless life was. A guy came up to me after the show and asked, why comedy? <laughs> that was all he said. I was dumbfounded. I started doing comedy in the late 80s. I was raised in Albuquerque, but I went to school in Boston, and that's where my career started. After I placed second in a regional competition sponsored by radio station WBCN, the competition was called the Comedy Riot. There were several rounds. We started out with a five-minute round, then a 10, and after that, a 15. 
that was probably about all the material I had when I started working, which was immediately after the uh, contest. Back then, there was an unspoken system in comedy. You started at open mics, then you opened or hosted, then you middled or featured, and then you graduated to headlining. Those were the hoops. The time it took to jump through them varied depending on opportunity and talent. So I started, op I started with the open mics. Boston had a few clubs, but once I'd run through every one of them, I entered the world of one-nighters, road gigs, usually contracted out by bookers to pubs, bars, bowling alleys, hotel conference rooms, dance clubs, VFW halls, college cafeterias, patios, parks, boats, or people's homes. In other words, any type of venue other than ones that were conducive to performing comedy. A place called the Boston Comedy Company would book you on a show and you'd go by their headquarters in a basement in Alston and pick up your directions. As an opener, I would get anywhere from 50 to $125 to drive anywhere from 10 to 500 miles to open for another act. Truth. Most of the gigs were two-man shows. The opener did a half an hour, and the headliner did 45 minutes, and then you got the fuck out of there unless it was a two-nighter or an island with no way off like Nantucket and its muse, a club that put you up in the band house, a cinder block shack out back with bunk beds. There was no choice. There was no boat until the morning. Horrendous. <laughs> I drove everywhere to do gigs anywhere. Pancho Villas in Lemonster, Franks in Franklin, Cranston Bowl in Cranston, Rhode Island, Captain Nick's in a gunkwit, Maine, Jimmy's in Dedham, Nick's at the Kowloon in Saugus, the University of Maine at Machias, the Taunton Regency, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof on Martha's Vineyard, Margaritaville in Worcester, low ceilings and stale beer and graffiti on the bathroom walls and crowds of angry New Englanders. Among these crowds, I felt like a puzzling freak or a crazy but harmless visitor who for some reason demanded everyone's attention all the time. Most of the time I drove home for hours, half drunk, chain smoking in my car, reliving my set. I always felt like I had survived something, that the simple fact that I had made it through the show meant I was victorious. But the war wasn't over yet. The next battle was in the car, the war I waged on myself. I'm not funny enough, that joke didn't work. Why can't I stop sweating? Fuck those people. I need more jokes. Where the fuck am I? Shit, I don't have a map. I will never forget the electricity of post-performance elation and self-flagellation flying through the New England countryside at night in a VW Golf. Not romantic, but those gigs were my training. I learned to do comedy anywhere for anyone in almost any situation. I'm gonna keep doing this. This guy, this guy was important. It was, a, it was weird. I, was a, I did this. Uh, I read this the other night, and like, it, it, yeah, I choked up at some point. It was. It's odd when that happens. You know, they, there's parts of this book. Like when I was on the radio with Terry Gross, and I don't. Yeah, I'm not dropping names. I did that. You know. Uh, <laughs> you know, I started reading this stuff, and I was embarrassed. You know, about some of the content. And then she said, "You know, you wrote it. It's in the book." And like, I'm like, "Oh my God, you're right. I did." All right. One-nighters were contracted out for a certain amount of time, and no headliner wanted to do a single a minute of material more than necessary. So the opener had to do a full half hour or else get shit from the headliner, who'd be forced to stretch his material to make up the time. If you were opening, you were also probably driving the headliner to the gig. So if you didn't do your time, it could be a long ride home. Around the time I started out, uh, around the time I was starting out, a comic, a comic named Frankie Bastille had just moved to Boston from Cleveland. He has since passed, and I'm not sure that many mourned him. He was a comic gypsy, a road warrior, a drug fiend, and a borderline criminal. I liked him, but I was in the minority. One of the first one-nighters I did was with Frankie. We would go on to do several more, but the routine was always the same as the first time. I'd go to his apartment building to pick him up. As I was walking down the hall, I'd hear a voice screaming down the hallway from behind a closed door somewhere, where's my tooth? Where's my fucking tooth? <laughs> the first time I knocked on his door, Frankie opened it and smiled big, revealing a missing front tooth. Hey man, you the opener? Yeah, I'm Mark. Frankie, I can't find my tooth. <laughs> Frankie had a false front tooth on a mouthpiece that he would always seem to misplace. 
the ritual of finding the missing tooth repeated itself every time I had to pick Frankie up. More often than not, the tooth was very close by, sometimes in his pocket. He looked ragged in a rock and roll kind of way, a bit like Keith Richards, which he, which he was aware of, aware and proud of. He had a Tibetan chant tattooed around one of his arms, and he was charming like a con man. You wanted to be around him, but you didn't want to get too close, leave him alone with your stuff, or owe him anything. <laughs> the first gig I worked with Frankie, we had to drive a couple of hours into Connecticut to do a show at a bar and dance club. The entire way down, Frankie laid down the law. He kept saying, the most important thing is doing your time. He also recited to me a poem called The Road about being a road comic. I can't recall what it was, but it was earnest and celebratory like a pirate shanty. <laughs> I was nervous about doing my time. I had not done many gigs and I was just getting up to around a half an hour. The club was packed. There was a disco ball hanging over the crowd and lots of mirrors around. I took the stage and did all the jokes I had. When I'd finished my act, I said, thank you very much. You're a great crowd. Now let's welcome your headliner to the stage. He does clubs and colleges all over, Frankie Bastille. The crowd cheered, but Frankie did not take the stage. The clapping tapered off, and I was still standing at the mic. No Frankie in sight. I tried again. Please welcome Frankie Bastille. Nothing. The room is starting to get that awkward tension. I'm not sure what to do. Then a voice comes out of the darkness from the back of the room. 26! It was Frankie. What? I said, panicked, squinting into the darkness. You did 26 minutes. You have four minutes left. Uh, I scrambled and did a street joke and then brought Frankie up. He did his 45 and we got into the car to drive home. I started to apologize, but he cut me off. You got to do your time, man. He said, and that was it. Just a little more about Frankie. I did not aspire to be Frankie. He was infamous in certain comedy circles, but not really respected or liked. No one really knew him, and he liked it like that. In the 80s, there were a lot of people doing comedy who just seemed to be keeping a few steps ahead of the IRS, ex-wives, and parole officers. Frankie was one of them. There was a story that he was arrested walking off stage for a parole violation, and the cops found out because they had heard him on the radio plugging his weekend show. <laughs> he learned his lesson. From that point on, he didn't give out headshots. He didn't want to be on the marquee or in the paper. He didn't stay in any one town very long. He always had people after him for one reason or another. I figured Frankie liked drugs, but I had no idea what, was really up, what he was really up to until we took a trip down to Cape Cod. The gig down there was at a massive Chinese restaurant called Johnny Yee's. The comedy show followed a Polynesian dance show. The restaurant had a huge stage that they pulled out for the dancers and then rolled back in when they were done. The stage that was left for us was six feet high and you had to walk up some stairs to get on it. There was a moat of dance floor between you and the first row of tables. It was in Yarmouth, so it was about an hour and a half drive. I picked up Frankie, we looked for his tooth, and hit the road. Once we got onto the Cape, Frankie asked me for a dollar bill. I gave him one, he rolled it up. He pulled out a small packet out of his pocket. It was a bundle of what looked to be 10 smaller packets. I know now, I know now these were dime bags. He ripped one open, stuck one end of the bill in the bag and one in his nose and snorted the contents. He sniffed a bit, looked at me, smiled and said, you ever try heroin? <laughs> no, I said, concerned but curious. You want to? Not right now, maybe later, I said. I was driving a car. <laughs> then Frankie started to nod off. I watched his body drift and sway with the car. He was in and out of consciousness. I stopped for gas, and while I was filling up the car, he woke up, stumbled into the office of the gas station, and stole a stack of the station's business cards. He started scratching out Joe Shell with a pen and putting his name on there. <laughs> he thought this was hilarious. I still have one of the cards. When we were about 15 minutes from the gig, he passed out cold. And when we got to Johnny Yee's, I had to walk him into the club and lay him out in a booth. 
The guy who booked the place, this 300 pound guy in a Hawaiian shirt named Wayne, asked me if he was okay. I said, I thought so, but I wasn't sure. I'd never dealt with a guy on the deep nod before. Since I was opening the show, I couldn't really keep my eye on Frankie. I got up on stage, I did my time, all of it. When I introduced Frankie, I wasn't afraid of him shouting out my time. I was afraid of him not coming on stage at all. The last I saw him, he was hunched in a booth. I announced his name with a slight inflection at the end, Frankie Bastille. <laughs> and he bounded onto the stage, took the mic, thanked me, and proceeded to do one of the most engaging animated live stand-up shows I have ever seen. He worked the stage, he acted out his bits, he sweated profusely like no one I'd ever seen on stage sweat. He finished and got a standing ovation. I sat in the booth in the back, baffled and amazed. All I could think was, that guy is a fucking pro. <laughs> we got into the car after the show, and within seconds, Frankie was back on the nod. He stayed that way for the entire trip home. I didn't want to be Frankie, but I didn't mind being with him, watching him nod off in the car, in the car seat next to me after a killer set. That, I thought is a comic. Yeah, he died and uh, I don't, you know, it was weird. Yeah, he's, there was some real stories about Frankie. I don't, <laughs> he was, yeah, he was something else. But, um, so there's a, uh, there's another option here for the next reading. Uh, I, you know, I don't know, it might diminish some of the respect you have for me. But as Terry said, you wrote it in the book. It's, it's pretty horrible. Look, you know, I'm not, I'm not that filthy a, a guy, really. I'm, you know, I'm fairly standard filthy, not too adventurous filthy. You know, and you know, and I got comic friends who are, you know, are pretty filthy. And you know, I, you know, Jim Norton is a friend of mine. You know, and, and I had this. You know, I had these stories, and like, you know, I don't have, you know, all his book, his whole book's about filth, you know, and I'm like, I don't, I don't have any filthy stories, and I was thinking, like, oh, I've got these two prostitute stories, and they're both horrible. There's nothing celebratory about them, but in my mind, I'm like, well, Jim would put them in. Jim would, would put all of them in, and I'm like, all I got is two, and then I'm like to myself, well, put them in. You got to put them in. Like, they're like, they're just sitting here in the book. I don't know why they're in there. Like, did I have to write about prostitutes? Why do I have to tell you people this shit? <laughs> but there, it's in there, two prostitutes. That's it, right in there. I don't do prostitutes. I'm not a hooker guy. I've had two experiences with prostitutes. Neither of them was fun or sexy or hot or anything but disturbing. They happened sometime in the late 80s when I was a struggling comic living in Boston. I was staying at my girlfriend's apartment near Symphony Hall. The neighborhood was dicey late at night in a crackhead and hooker kind of way. I remember on one occasion, I got up to move my car from one side of the street to the other at 6.30 in the morning, and this woman walked up to me looking very drug frazzled and soul hungry in a very skanked out and evil way. She grabbed my crotch and said, do you want a date, baby? It was that kind of neighborhood. One night I'd been out doing a show. Afterward, I got all hopped up on blow and booze and made my way home at about 3.30 in the morning. The woman I was living with was out of town and I parked the car. After I parked the car, a sketchy looking guy wearing a fedora walked up to me and said, Coke, I'm good, I said. There was a woman walking behind him, short, too much makeup, maybe Latino. She said, you want a date? At that moment, not a rare moment, I was consumed with self-hatred and really high. That is the magical combination that brought me to, yes. <laughs> How much, I asked. I'd never paid for sex in my life. 30, she said. So this was not a high-end escort situation. <laughs> this was a dirty street hooker situation. Okay, what do we do? Where's your car? I live right here, I said. Bringing her into the house that I shared with my girlfriend was like polluting our home with the evil essence of street. We walked up four flights. She was wheezing after one. <laughs> How many more flights? A few more, I said, in the middle of my own steep shame assumption. We got into the apartment. She was catching her breath. What do we do? I asked, like a moron. You have the money? 
I handed her $30, she put it in her purse and started to breathe normally. Is this your first time paying for it? Yes. Well, don't worry, baby. Lie down and take your pants off. I lay down on the bed. She kneeled between my legs and hunched over me and started giving me head. It was just ugly. It wasn't working for me. There was too much shame, weirdness, and coke. So I asked, can you take your shirt off or something? It's 10 more bucks. I pulled a 10 spot out of my wallet and handed it to her. <laughs> okay, here's $10. She took her shirt off and put my hand on her breast and said, do you feel a lump in there? <laughs> really? She continues to go down to me and, and I'm feeling her breast for lumps. And I, I guess you get what you pay for because it, it was definitely not sexy and, and I did feel a lump. It was horrifying. I had a moment where I thought maybe she should be paying me for the examination. Uh, yeah, there, there's, there's something there. I know, right? I have to get that checked out. Yeah, you should definitely get a second opinion. And she's sucking my cock on and off throughout this exchange. Then the phone rings and it's my girlfriend leaving a message. We hear it in the room. I'm lying there with my cock in the mouth of a woman who's possibly cancerous breast is in my hand. A woman I'm paying to have sex with on our bed and I hear, hi honey, I guess you're sleeping. Just calling to say I love you and I miss you. Is that your girlfriend? Uh, yeah, that's nice. I couldn't have imagined that such a pitch, uh, that such a perfect storm of shame and self-hate was possible in one scenario. Somehow I was able to finish because once I set my mind to something, I can usually follow through. It was a very sad orgasm. My dick was crying. When I'm done, she of course tells me she doesn't usually do this, that she works with computers. Then she asks me if, I can, if she could take my cigarettes and condoms from my dresser and all of the change. I say, sure. I thank her, let her out, and immediately go into my bathroom and scrub myself like I'm dirty under my skin. I really tried to believe that she worked with computers. <sighs> my second hooker story... I'm sorry, ma'am, I'm sorry. It's a, I'm apologizing to a woman that doesn't seem that she should want to hear this. Yeah. I'm sorry, is it because you have a hard time with my, my portrayal of hookers that you don't want me to see me in this situation? I was very young and fucked up, but this one's got some poetry to it, it's pretty beautiful. Why not embrace all of who we are? This is a reality, lady. This shit is out there. My second hooker story was a similar situation. This one is a little more poetic. I had moved to Somerville, which was at the time a malignant suburb next to Cambridge, but once again found myself in downtown Boston. I just finished a set at Nick's Comedy Stop. It was 2.30 or 3 in the morning, the magic hour, apparently. I was partying with some comics at a bar that let us stay after closing, just a block from the infamous combat zone in Boston, a nasty few blocks of depravity and dirty fun. I'm in my car, in the zone, driving home, festering high and hating being me. I see this hooker walking that walk down the street and I think, ugh, all right. <laughs> I'm gonna try again. <laughs> I pull up, she gets in the car, I'm coked out of my mind, I ask her how much and she says $30. So again, I'm dealing with a very high level of escort here. <laughs> 30 bucks for a blowjob, yeah. She has a bit of grit and gravel in her voice. It is the far end of the night. Who knows what she has been through already? How many cars, cocks? I give her the money. Okay, where do we go? I say nervously, coked. Just pull around the corner up ahead. 
Layered beneath the rasp in her throat is that undeniable and annoying New England accent. <laughs> so I pull around the corner, park, and ask, what now? I'm still not experienced with street hooker etiquette or process. Pull down your pants. I do. She places a condom over my coked, frightened cock, which at that moment is frantically trying to retreat into my body. <laughs> Rightly so. What's wrong? Nothing. Then she looks at me and says through her phlegm, I don't usually do this. I'm just in town for my father's funeral. I think, huh? That is just too deep to take in. Maybe this is her way of grieving. It ripples my mind with sadness. Just as she's about to start working on me, two squad cars come out of nowhere and surround my car. Their headlights blind me. I panic and say, what do I do? Well, I think you should pull up your pants. I'll deal with this. I do what I can in the moment. She gets out of the car and goes into some shtick with the cops, talking about how I saved her from her boyfriend who was beating her up. I can't immediately tell if they're buying it. A cop comes around to my window. I open the window. He shines a light in my face. This is a time in Boston when they list busted Johns in the paper. It's not the kind of press I'm looking for. <laughs> Where do you live? The cop asks. Somerville. Why don't you go there? I will. Thanks, officer. My heart was pounding with cocaine and fear as I drove down the expressway. I was relieved. I couldn't believe he let me off. There was enough coke and alcohol in my system to bust me for a DWI, never mind the two lines of blow I usually save for breakfast and a bindle in my pocket. Once I got out of the zone and down the road a bit, I looked down and saw that I had not really pulled my pants up properly. They were like halfway up and my underwear was still down and the head of my dick was sticking out of the top of my pants with a half unrolled condom hanging off it. It was mocking me, <laughs> reprimanding me. It was angry and disappointed with what I almost put it through, not to mention ashamed. That was the last time I ever paid for a prostitute. It only cost me 70 bucks to discover that I'm not a prostitute guy. And my consolation is that I help two women. One, to confirm her fears and hopefully get to a doctor. The other, apparently, to process the death of her father. <laughs> we do what we can. <laughs> you want to talk about cats? Oh my God, those are horrible stories. <laughs> so funny though. So it was a long time ago. It was like, uh, what year was that? Uh, wow, that's like 88, man. 88, 98, 2008, really, 26 years ago. Wow, what happened to that guy? So let's, uh, like, I, you know, the cats I talk about a lot, but I mean, I could talk about, um, or I could read the, the part. You guys, most of you guys have heard this story about me getting the uh, cats, right? No? All right. Some of you have, all right. I can, I can do that. Meow. So this, uh, I, I'll just jump in here. This is when I was working for Air America. And uh, thank you. I hope you're not disappointed in me. I pulled out. You know, I think I was there soldiering on when we needed it the most. But right now, I can't, too, too, too much else going on. It's too complicated now. I'm disillusioned. My idealism is crushed. So I, I was working at Air America, and uh, I was married to a woman who was in Los Angeles. Her name was Mishna. There's more about her in the book. That's the other tricky thing about memoir, isn't it, folks? Like, do you put people in the book? Obviously, I put my dad in the book, and I was willing to take that hit. I knew that that might go bad. It'll come back around. He's too needy to ice me completely. <laughs> <laughs> you 
He'll, he'll get, well, you know, you have to realize my father was like, you know, all right, so you wrote this book, the media is going to contact me. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> he said that in an email. The media is going to contact me and probably your mother. About what? <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? He had pictured like, you know, this thing was going to be so big a deal that they were going to come question him about the integrity of my portrayal of him <laughs> and that he would have to cop to something. You know, ridiculous. So at this point, I was living alone in New York, separated, you know, by, by distance from my wife, but we were, you know, struggling, the marriage was struggling, and I was getting up at like 3.30 in the morning to get to the radio station to prepare for a 6 o'clock a.m. show. It was a very, you know, kind of lonely and weird life. So that's, that's where I'm at during this. As the months went by, things just deteriorate, deteriorated. Mishnah would come to New York for a few days, or I would go home for a few days, but the distance between us became hard to navigate. I was lost, angry, and tired. About this time, I began noticing a pack of stray kittens in the back of my building. I would go out in the middle of the night to put my trash in the bins, and these five kittens would be scrambling around eating the garbage in the dark. They were so clean, cute, and focused. Like most of life, the scene was simultaneously adorable and awful. I thought to myself, someone better deal with this, or these cats are going to fuck each other, and we'll have an army of incested kitties out here. This went on for a couple of weeks, and I began to fall in love with these cats. There was this orange tabby with a tuft of hair on his nose that was a little asymmetrical and made him look like a monkey. There was a calico, a black and white long hair, a mean-looking, skittish, striped cat, and this gray and white, dwarfy, fist of feline beauty that I would eventually name La Fonda. <laughs> La Fonda is crazy, like Vietnam crazy. <laughs> it's my fault. Their mother was also around, the slut. I really didn't know what to do with the cats. They wouldn't let me get near them, but something had to be done about them. I just kept hanging on to the hope that someone else would deal with it. The truth is, I was completely taken with two of these cats. I just thought they were too good to become alley cats. They were so perfect and clean and innocent that I didn't want them to live that harsh alley cat life. I think the impulse to save animals is, aside from being empathetic and humane, also symbolic of saving some part of ourselves. I wanted these cats to be okay. I wanted to be okay. The night before the 2004 Republican National Convention, I was freaking out. We were going to cover the convention live at the booth in Madison Square Garden, behind enemy lines. I was nervous and I couldn't sleep. So of course, I decided I was gonna deal with the cat issue. That's how I do. When life is scary and chaotic, I like to make it more so. <laughs> I took a large shoe box and cut a hole in it. I put a small can of food in the box and set it out by the garbage can while I stood behind the basement door and watched. I had recruited my neighbor Jody to help me. Her job was to make sure I didn't completely freak out. I saw the first cat get in the box. I scrambled outside, quickly covered the hole in the box with a piece of cardboard, picked the box up, and ran it up two flights of stairs to my apartment. I released the animal into my place, and it scurried, scared and crazy behind the stove. It's freaked out, I thought. It will grow to like me. <laughs> Over the next few hours, I performed this same procedure with four of the five kittens. Once I finally had them in the house, it was like I'd released a pack of wild ferrets into my living room. <laughs> they weren't acting like house cats. I didn't realize at the time that if a cat is eating on its own, it's not a cute house kitten, it's feral. I had trapped and released four wild animals <laughs> into my apartment. Two of them lodged themselves behind the stove. When I looked back there, all I could see were, the, were two gaping, hissing mouths directed at me like, <laughs> The cat that I named Monkey went flying down the hallway and attempted to jump out a window. I was two stories up. He hit the screen, then climbed up the screen and wedged himself between the screen and the window. He stayed there for two days. La Fonda got herself stuck to a glue trap I'd laid out for mice. She was flopping around on my kitchen floor, a mess of angry gray fur attached to a card. She didn't know me, I didn't know her, and I had to pull her off of the trap. Her claws ripped through my hand, but I managed to detach her from the goo plate. I believe the terror of that incident got locked deep in her wiring. She's still twitchy about it. That was her nom. <laughs> in the days that followed, I tried to shoo them back out the door, 
but they didn't even know where they were, so they wouldn't even leave the apartment. I had no idea how to handle the situation. I tried to pull the uh, I'm your parent now thing, but these cats were already about three months old. They weren't trying to hear that mess. I was, I was surrounded by vicious little things and all I'd wanted was friends. <laughs> Night was the worst. The black and white cat, whom I called Hissy, would sit in the window of the kitchen, which faced out the back of the building. She would wail, and her mother would answer in the alley. It was heartbreaking. I was living in a cat opera, and, and, and I was the bad guy. The other one, whom I called Meanie, had a very frightening stink eye that he would shoot at me. He was horribly menacing for something that size. Monkey dislodged himself from the window and LaFonda, after the mousetrap incident, spent most of her time under the couch. When I shut the door to my bedroom to go to sleep, they'd all emerge from under my covers. It sounded like my house was being ransacked and robbed. <laughs> I would let it go on because I wanted them to have fun. <laughs> when I woke up and walked into the living room, there were no cats, but half the couch was ripped open and the stuffing was all over the floor, books were destroyed, the rug was partially unwoven, and the TV was on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Wait, I wanna, I'll get to the part where I had to move them. Uh, okay, so I, I, I got rid of a couple of the cats. I gave them away. Someone I, I was talking about on the radio. And, uh, and, and some woman took one. She knew it was feral. And then I gave one to the, the deli guys across the street that wanted a mouser. And yeah, I don't know what happened to that cat. Because I went over there and they, they were like, that cat you gave us was crazy. And, was like, <laughs> and I'm like, I know. That's why, that's why I gave him to you. I thought he'd be okay over here. What happened? It's like, he's with my cousin in Brooklyn. You know, I didn't know what that meant. Didn't think too hard on it. All right, so let's do this. There was no way I was leaving Monkey and LaFonda behind. I loved just about everything about them and I needed them in my life, despite the fact that they clearly had little or no interest in me, much like the women I tend to fall in love with. Raising feral cats was something I was getting used to, but transporting them was a whole other box of horror. Mishnah flew out and picked up Monkey. She said it wasn't that big a deal, but it was my job to carry the mighty LaFonda across country. I was terrified of LaFonda. I still am. She is nothing but a ball of muscle and claws. The only time she had ever been in a cage was to go to the vet to get fixed, and it took two of us even to get her, into, to get her to do that, and one of us was a registered cat lady. Now I was alone and completely panicked and tweaked. I put on leather gloves, got my mind into a by any means necessary state, and approached the cat. I wrestled her to the ground and picked her up with both hands. She bit through the gloves and lunged at my face, drawing blood on my arms with her claws and biting through thick leather into my hand. When I finally got her into the cage, she shit all over it. All my cats do that. As soon as I get them in the cage, they evacuate their tiny cat bowels as if to say, fuck you, who wins now? <laughs> Once I got her secured, <laughs> I bandaged my face and arms and finger. There were scratches up and down both my arms, but I'd completed my mission. I'd courageously wrestled the wild into submission like some primitive. I felt connected to a tradition of men who hunted and led tribes. <laughs> I had my bags packed and my cat boxed, and I headed to JFK Airport for my flight. Things were going pretty smoothly. I was waiting on the security line and was about to put the cat box on the belt to go through the machine when a Transportation Security Administration guy said, yeah, you're gonna have to take the cat out of the box and walk it through. I said, what? There's no way that's gonna happen. Well, then you can't go through, he said. And I said, do you know what I've been through? Look at my hands, look at my arms, look at my face. There's no way I'm taking that cat out of the box. I was yelling, waving my arms at a TSA dude. 
People were looking at me, some shocked, others just perturbed. I was that guy. I was a crazy cat lady guy. <laughs> my biggest fear is that I would get her out of the case and she would jump out of my arms and my life would become a Disney comedy. <laughs> I pictured a montage of me running after a cat on jetways, you know, down aisles of planes, in the middle of a runway, on aircraft wings, you know, <laughs> behind ticket counters, on a baggage claim. You know. I'd made such a scene that when I went to take LaFonda out of the box, the, TSI, the TSA guy said, all right, everyone stand back. <laughs> like I was defusing a bomb. I lifted little LaFonda out of the crate and she was more frightened than I was, but not much. I walked her quickly through the metal detector and then started screaming, where's the box? I didn't know at the time that all she, would all she would want to do was get back in the box. The airport was just a big blur of sights and sounds that were alien to her. The box she understood. I got her back in, sheepishly apologized to the agent and gawking passengers and skulked away toward my gate. We made it home and now my cats are free. I lost a job, a marriage, and several pints of blood in the process, but they've won. They've started, they started in the garage in Astoria, Queens, and now live in the hills of Highland Park, California. This is a cat success story. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna do one more quick one, all right? Barbara? Because I think we should get up to date. Now, you know, Jessica, my girlfriend, it's, it's the thing about writing memoirs that like I had written a piece with her in it about our, uh, the, when we broke up, which was very dramatic and horrible. And I wrote the piece and I literally waited till like three days before the final manuscript was due to let her read it. Three days, because I knew she had to read it because I, you know, was gonna have to live with her. And she read it and she's like, this is ridiculous. You were not the victim in this situation. I don't like the way you represented this. It, you know, it is not truthful. And I'm like, what, that's what happened. And she was from your point of view. And I'm like, it's my book. And she's like, well, if you want me to remain your girlfriend, you might want to rethink this piece. I'm paraphrasing. So I just tried to edit it. Like I took a couple lines out and added a couple words. She's like, oh really, you think that did it? And then, uh, and then I called my editor and I said, if we don't take that piece out, there's gonna be legal problems. <laughs> and he took it out. And then I had to write this other piece, which was uh, a little more appropriate. Um, but I don't think she's read the book. And she keeps like not reading it, which I think is okay. You know, like it's getting to the point where I'm like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't read it. You know what I mean? Maybe that'd be better. Oh, here it is, okay. Yeah, let me, I'll just blow through this and then we'll, we'll talk. It's called Babies. I've had two wives, but no, uh, but no children. When my first wife started reading baby books, that was a red flag to me and I freaked out. I knew I had to get out. I wasn't ready. I felt like if I had kids, I would have no life, that everything I wanted to accomplish would have, would have to go on hold or get ditched to service the kid, that my ridiculous show business dream would have to be reined in and I would just have to do whatever was necessary to support a family, that I would be resigned to a life of bitter surrender, trying not to infect the kid with my sadness and disappointment, hoping the kid didn't notice my deep resentment of his or her part in my failure. So clearly, I wasn't in the right frame of mind. When I was with, my, with the second wife, I thought maybe we could do it. Maybe we should do it. In my mind, I was ready. She wasn't. She put it very succinctly. You think I'm going to bring children into this? My response was something along the lines of, what does that even fucking mean? You don't think I'd be a good father? Fuck you. Fuck this. <laughs> the fact is, she was right. I was an abusive, selfish, needy, angry asshole. Now I'm just kind of selfish, a little less angry, occasionally needy with flights of asshole. I've grown. <laughs> After the second divorce, I accepted that I wouldn't have kids. I didn't have a woman in my life. I was getting old. 
I would probably be happier without them. I could put an end to the genetic bundle of selfishness, depression, and anger that has tumbled down through time along my father's line of descent. I would be, do, I would be doing the world a favor. I'm not sure my parents ever wanted to have kids. I think they did it because that was what they were supposed to do. It was what their generation did. The truth is, they were kids themselves when they had me. My mother was 22 and my father was 26. I don't really think of them as parents. They're just these people I grew up with who are a little older than me. My parents were always too worried and panicky, too consumed with themselves to ever make me feel like things would be okay. So now I'm a panicky, worried, self-consumed adult who's fundamentally unable to feel like things will be okay. There's some part of me that will always be looking futilely, futilely for a parent to just make things okay. My mother has stepped up her parenting game over the last few years and she applies these new skills to my brother Craig's three kids. Grandkids have given her a second shot at being a parent, but in a more hands-off situation. She seems to be excelling. But when I watch my father around Craig's kids, it makes me sad to think of little me being raised by this man. He engages with them for a few minutes until he realizes they aren't really all that interested in him. Then he detaches. I was in Phoenix for a, uh, the bat mitzvah of one of Craig's kids, and I had to go pick my father up at his hotel and bring him over to the house. I got to the hotel, and I said to my father, you ready to go? Where are we going? He asked. He was getting dressed. We're going over to Craig so you can hang out with the grandkids, right? Without irony or a second thought, my father said, yeah, you know, some people get something out of that. I don't get anything out of that. <laughs> Completely deadpan. So I said, well, what do you want to do? You remember those mustard slacks I had? You can't find those anymore. I've looked all over. Okay, I said, a little afraid of the non sequitur. Let's go across the street to the mall and see if they've got them. My father and I then went to the mall across the street where he walked into the most expensive store he could find and dropped $300 on a pair of almost mustard slacks. Then we went to my niece's bat mitzvah brunch so my father could show off his pants. I'm at a crossroads. I'm in a relationship with a woman who's 20 years younger than I am. I'm not bragging. The age difference presents its own set of problems, but I love her. When we met, I had no idea that we would end up together. We thought we were just gonna hang out, have fun, move on. Now, after three years of very intense trials and tribulations, fits and starts, we're living together, and she wants a baby. I know this because she says things like, when are you going to put a baby in me? <laughs> I'm thinking, I don't know, when you frame it differently? <sighs> I knew this was something she always wanted, and now I find myself thinking, well, if I'm going to do it, it's going to have to do, be with somebody her age, and I love her, this is it. This is when it will happen. Now it is pressing. Everything within her is screaming, baby, now. When she's not worrying about her own years of fertility, she's concerned that if we wait much longer, I will be too old to make it for the long haul as a father. She's worried that by the time it all shakes out, she will have wasted years on me. I'm afraid that I'm already too old. When, people tell, when, people, when I tell people that, they say, you're a guy, you can have kids until you're 100 if you still have cum in your balls and a way to get it out. Sorry, I didn't mean to get clinical. <laughs> In response to that, I say, I don't want to do that to a kid. I remember the first kid I met with old dad. It might have been in nursery school. I can't remember the kid's name, but I recall waiting around after school for our parents to show up. Eventually, some old guy pulled up in a car and got out. And I said to the kid, who's that? That's my dad. How old is he? I don't even know. Does he do anything? Yeah, sometimes. I got to go. I have to help him. <laughs> I don't want a kid to go through that. It, is, it has been pointed out to me by people with old dads that your dad is your dad and that's it. You love him regardless. That sounds good in theory. I'm not quite sold. I know it's trendy for a man in his late 40s or 50s to have his first kid after a life of self-indulgence and fun craps out on him and doesn't deliver the deep win with the lasting answers. <laughs> I don't want to be that guy. On the other hand, I see men in their 50s and 60s who have never had kids, and I feel that they are missing something, some wisdom, some fundamental humility that comes with being forced to reckon with the kind of responsibility and selflessness that can only come from taking care of a child. Except for George Clooney, he seems okay. <laughs> Maybe I'm projecting, I'm sure I am. That's how I glean meaning. I make up lives and vibes for people I meet and see. The woman I'm with would be a great mother. 
She works with severely emotionally disturbed children, severely emotionally disturbed and autistic children. She teaches kids in very difficult situations how to relax and communicate. The patience necessary for that task is daunting and impressive. That on top of the patience necessary to deal with my bullshit should earn this woman some kind of humanitarian award or a child. Why can't I just do it? Just make a baby. I'm terrified. When she brings it up, I hear it as, a, an, as an attack or an ultimatum. I hear it as a manipulation, a trap, a way of staying connected to me, keeping me tethered to her for the rest of my life. My brain spins fear scenarios. Okay. My brain spins fear scenarios. Here's the list. One, the baby will be born dead. Two, the baby will die. Three, she will eventually hate me and turn the baby against me. Four, I won't know how to do the baby thing. Five, I won't be able to afford the baby thing. Six, the baby won't like me. Seven, I will drop the baby. Eight, I will ruin the baby. Nine, I will not be alive when the baby grows up. Ten, she will take my baby and go live with another man. Almost done here. We argue about it all the time. The arguments become horrible and full of anger and pain. She wants it to be fun, exciting, a new life, a family. I am buzzkilling her very real and reasonable wants, and it breaks my heart. We've been going to couples counseling to get me in the baby zone, to figure out what my fear is and overcome it. I love kids. I get along with kids. They seem to like me. What has been holding me back? People who have babies tell me I will know a love that is beyond anything I can imagine and a joy that is indescribable. Love and joy? That sounds horrifying. I have no way of knowing whether I can handle either of those. I'm much better with need and fear. They are what ground me. I still need someone in my life to make me feel like things will be okay. All day, every day, I go back and forth. I drift into fantasy of the amazing life I'd have with a baby, immersed in all the all-consuming but rewarding work of raising a child. Then moments later, for no good reason, I see the exact same scenario as being a hell on earth with no way out, full of drama, heartache, and pain. This is the cycle that spins daily in my head. Then there's the weekly cycle. Every week she brings up the fact that she wants a baby, a new house, an engagement ring. That's the panic trifecta for me. I usually spiral into a diplomatic but evasive argument about the struggle I'm having making the decision on at least two of the topics at hand. That gets her angry because she doesn't understand why she's with a man who isn't excited about doing those things with her. I make my case. I'm old, twice divorced, and emotionally retarded. She cries. I get mad that we're having the discussion again and try to bolster my defense with the fact that we are working on it in therapy. The other night, the argument began when we were in bed. Bedtime is the worst time to start an argument because all the drama unfolds while you're wearing your underwear. <laughs> Being angry in your underwear is a hard thing to pull off. We had reached the moment that pitches me over the edge into rage. I found myself standing beside my bed in boxers, screaming with embarrassing intensity, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And I stomped out of the room and down the hall and stood in the living room for a few seconds. Then I walked back down the hall, back into the bedroom and sat on the bed still fuming. She said, breathe, breathe, breathe. I had a tantrum. I am a child. <laughs> I took a deep breath, then another, then I started weeping. It's okay to be sad. You're going to be okay, she said, touching my shoulder. I love you, I'm sorry, I said, whimpering. I love you too, she said, comforting me sternly, but I'm not going to hang around forever. Thank you. So put your hand up if you have a question or want to talk to Mark Marin. Now's your chance. Talk to Mark Marin. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That guy loves to talk. Come on. Don't be intimidated. You'll be in your car on the way home and think, oh, I wish. I Andy, there's one so, right up there. Some people might be wishing they're in their car now. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, buddy. I'm, I'm wondering uh, what your relationship is like with your mother. Oh, uh, it's pretty good. You know, there's a piece in there. I let her read the piece about her. 
you know, uh, you know, she's okay. You know, she's got a job in life, and that's you know maintaining a certain weight. And um, <laughs> and you know, it, it's okay. You know, they're both pretty. You know, she she she's got actually gotten better and a little more supportive, and it, it's good. My relationship with my mother's good. There's a piece in there about cooking dinner at her house for Thanksgiving. She's sort of afraid of food, and I have to cook for the family. And there's another piece in there about a phone call she made to me. <laughs> about going in the hospital. But she's like, Mark, I don't care, it's good. So we're okay, the relationships, both the relationships are okay. <laughs> they just don't feel like parents. <laughs> Next question's over here. Yeah. Hi, um, I know sometimes with, with hecklers, you've really cut loose and gotten angry at them. I just wonder, has that happened at one of these readings yet? <laughs> <laughs> Almost did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, cut loose, you know, I'll engage. I like to engage. Sometimes I invite it. You know, I was at Powell's in Portland and some woman like was over there and there were babies in the room. There's like two, 300 people in Portland and a couple of people brought their babies. And like, you know, then I, I was gonna read the piece on babies and this woman was like, oh, no. <laughs> and I'm like, what's the matter? You know, and she's like, I, you know, it's just really, and I'm like, is there a problem with baby? She's like, you know the problem. <laughs> but she wasn't like crazy person. You know, I'm like, well, are we, can I just read it or what? She's like, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> and I'm like, are, is this relationship over? And then, you know, she was cool. And then at the end, she asked a question. She's like, are you concerned about the Jewish evil eye on you? It got very interesting. She, she really wasn't crazy, and she waited around till the end of the thing to, for me to sign her book, and she was like, look, you know, I get you. You know, I'm Jewish. My parents, uh, my, uh, my mother's narcissistic. My grandparents were Holocaust survivors. You know, I just need to know, you know, how much is too Jewy? And, you know, <laughs> you know, so it was complicated, but it didn't get out of hand. Yeah, I, I'm fairly giving. I mean, if a heckler is not, you know, uh, just trying to troll me or ruin a show, I enjoy talking to them. The next question right up here up front. Mm. Hey, so after reading that piece um, about you and Jessica, I'm an avid listener to the, the podcast. Yeah. And um, that was written a while ago. I'm wondering where you guys are at now. Actually, when I listen to your podcast, I'm like, is he going to announce it? Because you're like, yeah, I got well, big now, news, wait. folks. And I'm like, oh, wait, what happened? Is well, there's part of me that, like, you know, like, I, she, you know, she's not that public a person, and it seems like it's weird like, how I meet, what, why I end up with the women I do. Like, it seems to be the bane of her existence that I am a public personality. It was a very interesting dynamic. You know, we'll go to an event, she's like, oh, and then, like, what, am I just going to wait? And I'm like, yeah. Um, <laughs> but she's a lot of drama, but, but she's really, you know, I think she digs it on a certain level. What, what am I getting at? That I seem to be, you know, in denial about something. Like, I, I put a down payment on a fucking engagement ring, but I'm not admitting it to myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's sort of where we're at. Like, it's like I'm, I'm surprising myself at every turn. Like, not, like, you know, like, because she was like, you know, when are we going to look at rings? And I'm like, all right, we're going to look at rings, because I couldn't even surprise her with a ring, because God forbid with this woman, I give her the wrong ring, she would, I would never fucking hear the end of it. Because... Like, she's obsessed with her nails. Like, she does her nails. She spends hours on her nails now. And I'm like, what's with the fucking nails? She's like, because when I look at them, it makes me feel better. It calms me. And the, so then, then, like, the whole ring thing made, made sense. I mean, if I got her the wrong ring, and she's like, ugh, it just became the bane of her life. So, is this the right woman for me? <laughs> really what I, I mean I think it's just like oh I can't get the I can't get this ring for her because it'll be the wrong ring so no, maybe I, I just won't get the ring no, I just get her the right one I took her I said which one we went to two places you fucking kidding me like I'm, so you picked it I'm, out? I'm terrified of her what you already you picked it out with her so yeah 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 she picked out the own. one but then like then at least I wanted to be a surprise like sort of like okay I'm glad we looked at rings <laughs> but with the, like within hour she's like you, you know which one I want right I'm like yeah I do She's like, okay, it's just my anxiety. That's all, my anxiety. 
I'm like, I'm on top of it. And then the next day she's like, right? The ring, you remember? <laughs> I'm not being bullied. Um, <laughs> she's a pip. Yeah, so, so that's where we're at. I have a deadline on the baby thing. Apparently I have to start, you know, p- putting stuff inside of her by July. Because like, like a few months ago, you know, we're in therapy and she hasn't talked about it much, but like four or five months ago, she's like, uh, we were in therapy and, and, and it's very weird. We're in therapy with a couple. Isn't that weird? The, our therapists are a couple, you know, and we met with the guy and then he said, you know, my wife is available and we can do this all together or we could split apart and she could see her and you could see me. So we're doing this weird therapy thing. It's fucking amazing. Just two couples like having it out. And... <laughs> And I said, well, this baby thing's driving me nuts. And, she, and, she, can, and she's like, well, I said, can I have a deadline? She's like, well, July. If, you, if we don't start trying by July, I have to leave. <laughs> and went, yeah, so, you know. <laughs> you know me, I'm going to wait till July 1st. Wait, yeah. next question's up here to your left. Yeah. Uh, Mark, to save you from the marriage topic, is it really hard to do uh, book reading and not do stand-up for a whole show, or are you doing a lot of stand-up too, like Palace of Fine Arts? Oh, no, I do a lot of stand-up. You know, the book events, I, you know, I, I like reading what I wrote. Um, you know, sometimes, like, I, you know, I just started reading, um, like, I don't know if, to, sometimes I get impatient, and, like, in, in certain, when I'm reading, like, there's certain paragraphs where I'm like, oh, my God, this goes on forever. Uh, and that's like a comic instinct, like, oh, when is this going to get the laugh? Uh, I think that if I write another book, maybe I should do it like Sedaris does and, you know, actually <laughs> workshop in front of audiences, you know, but, uh, but it's a little different, but, it, but I like it, you know, I'm doing both. Like, I could do stand-up right now for an hour if you wanted, but I don't think really. <laughs> it's not, it's not that different, a posture. We'll take two more questions. Really? Okay. The next question over here. Is that okay? Your... Yeah. No, no, I, as many as you want. I've got nothing to do. Hi, Mark. Hi. How did you get over the insecurity of, like, backlash from writing a book about your friends and your family? How did you get there? Well, you know, I tried to be as as diplomatic as possible and, and, and take as much responsibility from my point of view as possible. You know, it's very delicate. You know, I don't feel like I slandered anybody. You know, so I think in writing it, um, like with my, with my second ex-wife, I wrote her, I said, look, I'm writing a book and you're going to be in it probably, but I'm going to be as honest as possible. And she wrote me back, um, I don't want to be in your book. So then I'm like, all right, well, fuck you. <laughs> there's, there, there, there's no insecurity. There's a little bit of heartbreak to it, you know, because I, I knew I was going to risk this relationship with my father, but I feel like the honesty of the dynamic was necessary for me to grow. And I feel like the honesty of what happened with the second divorce was necessary for me to process. I think it, it helps me, it helps other people. You know, these are weird, personal, angry feelings that are very specific and aren't spoken about that often. So I felt like it was worth it. Like the first wife, I think, I feel the worst about because she doesn't deserve any shit. And I think that the honesty of that relationship was that, you know, I got married to somebody that I wasn't in love with and I thought it would help me, you know, you know get normal. And, you know, I think that's probably going to hurt her. But on another level, it's like, well, she's remarried. You know, she's a big girl. What are you going to do? You can't write this kind of shit without hurting some feelings. And believe me, my dad will come back around. And I don't have to have a relationship with either of my exes. I don't have kids with them. <laughs> the last question's right here. Hey. What's hey, up? Mark. Hey, Paul. Um, my, I think I've told you this before, but I want to tell everyone else, but my wife and I listen to, like, probably two, over 200 of the 300-plus podcasts, and it's actually, we've listened to it on in so many great places where we're having a great time that we sort of feel like you're, I don't know, your family in a weird way, and yeah. it also equalizes our relationship. It's, it's, so just, just in case you're wondering, it actually has a great effect on people. <laughs> Good. But I want to ask you a particular question, having listened to all these um, different levels of comedian. And the Mel Brooks thing just was completely 
uh, beautiful. And then going, we did a thing where we played Mel and we put on the Carl Reiner after it and then the Dick Van Dyke. So it was like a little mini set, you know, yeah, yeah. three hours of nothing yeah. but this one area. Mm -hmm. And I just want to ask you, you get a little different when you're talking to what I perceive as, I won't call them father figures because that's loaded, but you know what I mean? People who are like your, your, your elders and who you obviously have an immense respect for. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the feeling and maybe name some of the other like giants that you've put in that category? Okay, sure. Uh, look, I, I, you know, when I respect somebody, it, it's usually earned. You know, I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't think that, you know, elders, you know, always deserve respect. I'm not biblical like that. I don't feel like parents deserve respect if they're shitty. Um, there are some old guys that, that I don't respect because of the way that they've treated me. But those guys, like, you know, if it's in my heart, then I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show the respect. I mean, I went over, like, two days ago, uh, I got an opportunity to, to interview John Fogarty. And, you know, I went over to his house, you know, and, and like, I have no idea what that guy's going to be like, but it's like, fucking John Fogarty. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Bad Moon Rising, you know, you know, uh, 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 you know, with all the other songs are just timeless songs, and you know, like, and that's when all of a sudden I'm like, so, uh, "Hi, Mr. Fogarty." You know, like, uh, it's a lot of mistering and like, you know, but but with Mel, you know, and and Carl and and Dick and, and Shelley, and the, you know, these are guys that it's it's not a paternal thing. It's just that you know, I am you're just sitting there with like these living Buddhas, these these historical figures in my mind. And I want them to be seen in their best light. I don't, you know, I don't like do interviews like that where I'm looking for controversy or anything like with Shelley Berman. Like I went out of my way not to bring up things that would aggravate that guy. Because, and there are things. He's a volatile guy. And like, and I knew, I'm like, you know, I'm gonna stay away from that because I want this guy to be appreciated and understood uh, for a generation that doesn't know who he is. And with Mel Brooks, I wanted to get a humanity, a connection with him that I didn't hear yet. Because Mel Brooks is the kind of guy, if there's two people, it was just him and I, and if there are two people in a room, that's an audience for that guy. You know, like if there's two people and there's one guy here and the other guy might laugh, he's gonna play to that guy, you know? And do that. Uh, but you know, like I, I lucked out and I did a lot of research. You want me to tell that story? As a way to close this thing, the whole Mel Brooks, Carl Ryder story? I love telling it, and I know I did it in two parts on the podcast, but, uh, but I love, like, it's so rare. You know, I had no idea any of the shit that is happening with me was gonna happen. I had no plan, I had no confidence that it would, none. I, you know, three years ago, I'd given up on TV, on everything. I'm like, I just gotta figure out how not to die broken alone and without insurance. That's all I wanted to do. So all this stuff is, is, uh, is a gift. And, and for me to actually have a Mel, personal Mel Brooks and Carl Reiner story, is like one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me in my life. And I will tell it to you now. <laughs> All right, so I get this opportunity to interview Mel Brooks. And I'm like, great, but I don't want the Mel Brooks that everyone else gets. I need to connect with this guy. So I watch old Dick Cavett shows. I watch the HBO with Dick Cavett. I watch some British guy interview him. I even listened to an episode of The Nerdist with him on it. That was not easy. <laughs> Hardwick and I are okay, but you know, really it's not easy. So I, I, I did my homework and I don't usually do homework to, you know, to a fault and also to, you know, to good results. But I get to Mel's office and it's just me and Mel. I walk in, his assistant says, you know, set up in there. I walk in, there's Mel. And on my way over, I'm thinking, how do I get something different from this guy? And I'm like, well, he's a Jew, I'm a Jew. I'm just gonna go full Jew. So, and I have sort of a zealot-like quality, you know, with people sometimes, if, they're, if they have a lot of charisma or they have a certain, like within five minutes, if you listen to that interview, I'm like, what, are you kidding me? I'm 75. You know, like, <laughs> of, of course I know what you're talking about. All right. There's an old Jew in me waiting to happen. So, so I'm with Mel. And we, we connect, we genuinely connect. I think I, like, you know, I, I was able to get him, you know, he told some stories that he always tells, but we went in different places and he respected my interest and there was a real connection. There was no audience. So it was a genuine conversation. He didn't have to defer to an audience for the laughter. So it was great. So we get done and he's like, you're great. You should have a talk show on television. And I'm like, all right, tell somebody that. <laughs> and then he says, 
you should talk to Carl, Carl Reiner. And I'm like, I would love to talk to Carl Reiner. He's like, I'll set it up. And I'm like, great. And I say, how is Carl Reiner? He goes, he's about 80%. Okay, so I pack up my stuff and I'm about to walk out and, uh, and Mel says, you know, you know what, I'll walk you out. And I'm like, oh, that's very nice, Mr. Brooks, that's great. So we're on the second floor of a Culver City office building. I think he's gonna walk me down the hall. So we walk down the hall and I'm at the top of the stairs. I say, thank you, for Mr. Brooks, I really appreciate what you did. He says, yeah, I'm gonna walk you, let me walk you down. So then we walk down the stairs and I'm at the door. He goes, I'll walk you outside. I'm like, okay. <laughs> So then we're outside and I go, well, thank you, Mr. Brooks. He's like, where's your car? <laughs> so it's in the parking lot. He goes, I'll walk you to the car. So, I, so I'm walking with little Mel Brooks and he stops at a Bentley and he goes, where's your car? I said, it's, it's over there. It's the camera. He goes, oh, I thought this was it. Why'd I walk you out here? <laughs> All right, so now we're doing shtick, you know? And I go, no, it's over there. And I go, thank you, Mr. Brooks. He goes, I'll watch you put your stuff in your car. <laughs> so I put my stuff in my car. And I go, all right, I'll see you later. He goes, you should be on television. You're very good. I go, great, thank you. He goes, I'll call Carl. Great. And I drive away. And then we set it up. You know, he calls Carl, and we get in touch with Carl's people. A few weeks later, I go to Carl Reiner's house. Now you know him and Carl Reiner, they spend almost every night together. It's, a, it's very beautiful, these, this guy's relationship. I mean, they're both widowers. And every night, Carl or Mel goes over to Carl's house. Carl's about five or six years older than Mel. He's 92 now. And they spend every night together. And I was fascinated with that, and that friendship, that enduring. And I go to Carl's, and this is a different situation. I go to Carl's house, and you can tell this is a house that Jews grew up in. I'm familiar with this, you know, it's my grandmother's house. It looks like it hasn't been changed. It's been probably the mid seventies. You know, I could picture, you know, uh, Rob Reiner growing up there. It's just a house that people live in. And I walk in and I'm greeted by George Shapiro, who is Carl's manager, all right? But he's also Carl's nephew and he's in his seventies. All right, that's what we're talking about. <laughs> Shapiro represents uh, Seinfeld. He's a big guy, but he's a little guy. You know, and I talked to him for a little while. He's like, Carl will be out soon. And I'm like, great. He's like, this is, you do this by yourself, huh? You just bring the stuff and you set it up. I'm like, yeah. He's like, wow, that's something. So <laughs> I set it up. You know, I said it because I've learned to bring a boom. Like, you know, I learned from Jonathan Winters and Shelley Berman. I felt, I used to, I felt awful. I should have learned with Jonathan Winters the, the lesson because these guys, they get in their 80s. And, you know, I don't think twice about holding a mic, but to hold a mic for an hour when you're in your 80s, I mean, it, it can end up down here pretty quickly. You know, so I'm sitting there working knobs to accommodate this situation, you know, with Shelly Berman's like going, and then I went through, could you just, uh, you know, all right. So I bring a boom, I set it up for Carl. He comes down, you know, he's, he's regal in a way. He's tall, he looks good, he's 91, he sits down. And then George Shapiro goes to a chair directly across from Carl. And within five minutes, he does this. <laughs> Swear to God, he's out. In and out for the entire interview. There's a publicist sitting on the couch. I don't know who he was. So Shapiro's in and out of sleep. I'm sitting right here next to Carl. And I go, so you and Mel Brooks, you, you, you spend time every night together. You hang out. What do you do? And Carl goes, it, uh, it has to do with chicken feathers. Maybe I'll tell you. Okay. So we do the interview. And somewhere in the middle of the interview, you know, Shapiro's sleeping. The publicist is just sitting there. And somewhere in the middle of the talk, Carl goes, you know how many Jews are involved with the Broadway musicals? I'm like, I imagine a lot throughout the history of Jews and musicals. He's like, yeah, a lot. I saw a show, they had a list of them after the show. There's a lot of Jews. I'm like, I imagine that's true. He goes, I'll show you the list. I'll show you at the end of the show after we talk. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, you know, we finished the talk and then, you know, immediately 
Carl picks up two remote controls. Now, there, now this is a 91-year-old man, and he's playing with two remotes, so I don't know how long that's gonna go on for. <laughs> and then, like, right when I turn the mics off, George Shapiro is the first one to literally go, wow, great interview. <laughs> that was great, terrific. That's a good manager, too, like, like, I saw he was sleeping. Like, yeah, I don't know who he was talking to. So he stands up, he says, great interview, and then he goes, um, so then Carl's like, I gotta, how do I, which one is it? And he's playing with the remote. And then Shapiro goes, is there ice cream? <laughs> so he goes in the kitchen, comes out with several Weight Watchers ice cream sandwiches. Hands them to everybody. So now we're eating sandwich, ice cream sandwiches. Carl figures out how to use the remote. He starts the show at the beginning. This is a two-hour show. So I'm thinking, like, how long am I going to stay here? You know, not that it's bad, but it's going to get weird, you know. Then the phone rings, and Carl picks it up. And uh, I hear him go, hello? Yes, it was very good. He's still here. Hold on. It's Mel Brooks. I'm like, for me? So I take the phone, and I go, hello? And all I hear is Mel Brooks say, 80%, right? <laughs> and I said, I said, I don't know, maybe 85. He's like, all right, maybe 85. And then he says, put Carl back on the microphone, which was he meant the phone. So they give Carl the phone. Then Carl, I don't know what they were talking about it, but it seemed that Carl was trying to convince Mel that he could roast his own chicken. So <laughs> that went on for a little while. And then I realized I didn't ask him about the chicken feathers. So now I got to turn the shit back on because I thought it was important to cut that in to get that. So I go, wait a minute. And I turn the shit back on. I say, you mentioned chicken feathers, and you know, about you and Mel hanging out. What, is, what was the chicken feathers thing? He's like, okay, okay. And he says to the guy sitting on the couch, you have a pillow behind you? And the guy goes, yes. He goes, let me have the pillow. And then Carl puts a pillow on his lap. And I'm sitting there, and he just starts rubbing his hand back and forth on the pillow. So I'm thinking, like, you know, what's going on? <laughs> and then he stops, and he pulls a feather out of the pillow. And he very delicately puts it on the arm of the chair. And he says, I have a lot of these. <laughs> I put them in a bag. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. So now I feel like we're, we're off the reservation. <laughs> so I say, well, what, what does this have to do with you and Mel Brooks? And he starts rubbing again. He goes, and he looks at me and he says, this is what we do. <laughs> so... I say goodbye to Carl, he's, he's exhausted, he goes upstairs, and I pack up my stuff, and I'm walking out with George Shapiro. He's leaving at the same time as me, and we walk out the front door, and my car's over here, his car's right there, and as I'm walking to my car, he says, that was very good. I'm like, thank you very much, I appreciate that. He goes, what did Mel Brooks say? And I said, well, he said that uh, Carl was about 80%, <laughs> and Shapiro goes, he tells the truth. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening to my show. Thank you for buying the book. I'll be out front. I appreciate it.